Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us, and welcome to today's webinar titled Engaging Students Online in a Cl Clinical Pathophysiology Course, featuring Dr. Patricia Halpin. As the second webinar in this four-part education series, Patricia will discuss ways that you can vary your teaching to account for students' different academic backgrounds and how you can incorporate technology into, into your teaching by starting small. I wanted to take this moment to thank our sponsor for the event, AD Instruments, for making it all possible. I'm going to bring Patricia on here in audio. Patricia, are you there with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Sarah. Perfect. Take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Well, welcome and thank you for coming wherever you are. <laughs> and as Sarah already told you what I'm going to talk to you about today, and I wanted to start with, first of all, a beautiful picture of New Hampshire, where I am located right now. And I'm going to read the UNH Land, Water and Life Acknowledgement, which I'm very proud that we just finally got this. And my pronunciation is not what I think it should be, so I'm going to be reading it in English. As we all journey on the trail of life, we wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connection the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples have maintained to homeland, land, water, flora, fauna, which the University of New Hampshire community is honored to steward today. We also acknowledge the hardships they continue to endure after the loss of unceded homelands and champion the university's responsibility to foster relationships and opportunities that strengthen the well-being of indigenous people who carry forward the traditions of their ancestors. And I always start my classes this way. And like I said, I'm very happy that we finally have our acknowledgement and, and also being able to really bring the students to this level of information. And one of the other things I do with my class that has nothing to do with science is I like to bring in current events and I tell them that, you know, for the rest of your life, you're going to be asked things and you're going to be told, you're a scientist. I heard this on the news. What does this mean? Or explain it to me. And so to, to really bring some of the things that are topical or most topical right now in, in our state in particular is this invasive pest that has been coming across the United States from the Midwest. And it's called the emerald ash borer beetle. And so because New Hampshire is 85 percent forested. It's really a very big issue for our state. And so here it is, it's very pretty <laughs> and it's small. And of course, as an invasive pest, it has no natural predators. And so really to talk to them about our local ecosystem is always appropriate to bring into class. And this actually came to our state from the middle states in Michigan on firewood that someone brought because they were coming to our state camping. And it's really been devastating our trees. And so this is a year ago data that shows it moved from the south to the north and the lighter color are where it was already positive and infested and then the darker colors colors are a year ago and I'm expecting that it to be up in the northernmost Coas County by the end of the summer. And then again, linking this with our land water acknowledgement and the Native Americans that are still with us today and tell them that, you know, one of the trees that are used for the Native American basket making, which is a huge part of their coloring, color, culture, are ash trees. And 20% of our trees are ash. And so there's really quite an urgency to try and save some of these trees to preserve this craft making and basket making that is passed down generation to generation. So really providing your students, if they're just visitors to our state for a short amount of time with this knowledge, or if they're residential to our state, uh, is really important. And so shifting gears now to talking more about teaching, I wanted to go back a few years to this symposium that we presented back in 2017 at the experimental biology meeting. And it was really quite prophetic because we were talking about the changing landscape of course delivery and student learning. And we presented talks on live streaming, on MOOCs, on online labs, on flip teaching, and we were really saying that this is the future. And of course we got some pushback, especially with the online, online lab component. And people didn't think that we were moving this direction, but of course we were forced to. And so, and I was actually a little surprised this paper didn't get cited more when anyone, everyone was, was presenting all their COVID papers, but, and also to really go back even more in time, as you can tell already, I'm really interested in history and the fact that remote learning or asynchronous learning is not new at all. And 
you know, there was an awful lot of correspondence courses that you could take from many, many years ago where you would send in your money, you would register and they would send you the homework and then you would mail it back and you would either get a certificate or credits or, you know, some other recognition that you'd completed the work. So this has been going on quite a long time in the United States. And then actually, as far back as 1858, online degrees were offered by University of London, University of Chicago, Cornell University, University of Chicago, and others. So pretty diverse institutions. And so while some colleges and universities are moving to online degrees, it's not new. And also thinking about the different delivery modes, most of us are probably only thinking of two or three ways to deliver, but thinking back 100 years ago, over 200 colleges were licensed to offer courses via the radio. And these three schools, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Penn State, are some of the largest universities we have in the United States. And so they would, people would just sit and listen to the radio, and that's how they would get their content. And then, of course, with the advent of television, that was also used to offer courses. You would select that specific channel, and then you would sit there, and as this man is here, and then you would watch your course. And that's how it was delivered. And then, of course, when telephone became more available broadly, it was actually used to train physicians. So they would sit on the telephone and get their course that way. And then it was really the 1970s. So about 50 years ago, there were videotape lectures that were delivered. And a lot of universities adopted that. And it was also common for people that were serving in the military, if, especially if you were in the Navy, that they could continue their coursework, say, on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. They could still continue their coursework because the lectures were videotaped. So that increased their accessibility. And of course, everyone is familiar with what happened in March of 2020 when everything shut down and we were experiencing that global pandemic. And of course, classrooms then emptied and we all switched to remote learning. And so all at once, <laughs> I wanted to really take the opportunity to embrace the fact that the, the pandemic did provide us with opportunities to move from the face-to-face -face traditional classroom to online. And, and I have fully embraced this. And actually, you know, our students had been asking for more asynchronous online for a long time. And so I, t I jumped on that opportunity, actually. And so for what my schedule is like, which I absolutely love, is really a diversity. And so I teach undergraduates and from first year to fourth year. And so in the fall, I have this principles of biology class, which I call Bio One. And it's a tr traditional class for all science majors. And it's face to face. And then I have this ethical issues in biology class I designed. And from the very beginning, I've made it accelerated, which means it lasts only half a semester. And then hybrid, meaning that we're meeting either synchronous online or, and now I've switched it to face-to-face. -to -face, and then they have work to do um, asynchronously. And then also flipped, meaning that they, they have work to complete before they get to class. And so I took away all the exams and quizzes and things like that. So it's a discussion-based class, all active learning. And so they have to come prepared to class. And then the final one is this clinical pathophysiology, which I'm gonna give you more detail later, and that's asynchronous online. So I'm lucky to give to be able to present more than one type. And now this semester, I'm teaching the second half of that bio two, what I call, to keep it short. And then I designed this new class, Secret Lives of Wales, which is a general education for non-majors. And that is synchronous online via Zoom. And we've been allowed actually to have, to deliver these um, general educations via Zoom to continue or even asynchronous, which is wonderful. And we're finding that those fill first. And again, the students are taking those for a requirement to graduate. And, and like I said, you know, these two classes with endocrinology being the second one, you know, I really took that opportunity when as soon as COVID um, sent us all home to redesign these classes and to provide this alternative method of delivery for our science majors. So these would be the third and fourth year classes that they would be able to take. And they've been really popular. And again, students have been asking for many years, why, why can't we have more asynchronous online you know, for the major? And so by providing them, they jumped on it right away and they've been very popular. So, which I hope means I can continue to offer them that way. But regardless of the type of modality that I'm using, I, I started a, an assignment during COVID and I continue to do it depending, you know, every semester where a week before I send the students an announcement and I say that they have to make an introduction video. 
And most of you are probably familiar with this assignment, but I, if you're not, I would encourage you to do it because it's really helping to create that learning community. And so the students have to introduce themselves and then they have to show a picture of their favorite pet or a pet they wanna have. And so then I, I make my own little video and here I am with my little bunny, <laughs> very cute. And <clears throat> because we weren't traveling during COVID, I said, put a picture of a dream vacation that you would like to take. And I, I kept that in because I think we all, we all have that next vacation that we would like to take when we have time or money. And then I say, make it short, you know, less than two minutes, one cut, nothing fancy. Don't worry about, you know, how it looks. And then to post it in the discussion board of the course. And then the students have to comment on another student's video or ask a question. And I do that too. And so this has really been wonderful. For, and I give them a few bonus points, not too much, um, but the fact that they can do it before the class starts. And I find that most of them do and because they are in there poking around in the learning management system and they're, and they're wanting to know what book do I need? What, is, you know, what assignment is first and things like that. So it's, it's been a wonderful way to get to know each other. And it really benefits me because I start to learn the students' names and I learn something about them. And then especially with the face-to-face -face classes and those first year students, I can start class with some just fun information that I got from reading, watching their posts, sorry, watching the videos and reading their posts like, oh, I see we have a lot of dog lovers in here. And, or, you know, we've got some exotic pets that people have or want to get like this little hedgehog or this really cool iguana. And it really makes them feel comfortable with the beginning of class and reduces their anxiety, which is wonderful, you know, because especially with those first semester students, they're a little bit nervous. And then some other things I've done with my synchronous classes online is to, of course, synchronous means we're there on the same time. And with my ethics class in particular, I had to design the debate so we could still have it. And so the students work in teams all semester and they get to choose their name and their team color. And so in this case, we have the Black Panthers who are wearing the black t-shirts and then the platypi who are wearing the white. And as everyone knows on Zoom, you can't line them up as if their chairs are facing each other, which is what I would do in the classroom during a debate. And so we had to have a way to identify them. And then of course they take, and they, I give them, you know, some issues to discuss and then they're going to debate like organ donation, who should have first priority or right to die. Should that be passed in every state and things like that. And so this worked really well. And then I would also encourage everyone to have some fun with this technology. You know, we always get so focused on the content and we're, we're going to be able to deliver it all. And if the students are going to learn, but on the last day of class with these synchronous classes, I always make sure they know how to use all the newest tools and of course, these students all gave me permission to post their pictures. And then I showed them all the really cool things that you can do in Zoom. And this was a fun way to end, end the class and also to congratulate the students that were graduating. So don't be afraid to have a little fun with them and show them all these little things that they can do. They really appreciate it. And again, it reduces their stress and anxiety. And then of course, for the asynchronous classes, you know, which some of you are teaching already, you know, here, obviously I'm doing the work during the daytime and getting it done and the students are not online at the same time and they're almost always doing their work at night. <laughs> they are they are night owls and oftentimes the night before it's due, you can, you can see there's an awful lot of activity, which is fine, you know, they've scheduled it in that way and, and they get it done. And so now to focus a little bit more on that clinical pathophysiology class, I wanted to give you some examples of how, how I changed it and how I made it really um, a bit of a different class. And so one of the things that we'd been noticed, we'd offered this class for years, it was all face to face and they required a textbook and it was very popular. And, but of course, over time, I had been founding, finding that the students weren't buying the textbook because they were getting too expensive, you know, over $200 in many cases, up to 250 for the required text. And what I also found was that they weren't even buying it. And so now here we're assuming that these students are getting the information, the background information from the textbook, and oftentimes they weren't because they just weren't buying it. And so that really put them at a disadvantage to, compared to their classmates that could afford the book. And so that's when I looked to LT. And one of the things that I, I had the advantage of in, in the spring of 2020, I was not impacted by the rapid switch to COVID because I was in Australia. 
on sabbatical. And I had the opportunity to go to New Zealand and go to AD Instruments and meet with Tony McKnight and really talk to them about how I was going to redesign this course. And so I got to meet in his office and we chatted about it and he gave some good advice as well. And I'll be talking more about that. And I'm so glad I got to go um, to, to go and meet with him and work with him. And so the first thing I did with my students was I polled them and for what their background was. And so right away, and these are all undergraduates and typically third and fourth year students. And I was expecting, and it was true that they had all taken that first year biology sequence that I showed you that I'm teaching now, because it is a prerequisite. And then about half had taken anatomy and physiology. And then no one had taken animal physiology, which I wasn't surprised because I'm the only one that teaches it at our college and I haven't offered it since before the pandemic. I will be offering it next spring, however. And then another student, a few students had, had taken another physiology class, which wasn't me, so they were transfer students. So typically probably human physiology they brought in. And so I used my learning management system to design the modules and we use Canvas and most people design their courses this way. And then I, because only half the class had that background of anatomy and physiology, I felt the others were at a disadvantage. So I made videos with background information and I actually used some of my a &P slides to provide them with 10 to 20 minute videos on background information. And I, and I encourage them to start there. And also for the students that may not have had a &P in a few years, that was a refresher for them. And I also used the quiz um, function to quiz them on LT again, so it would all be in Canvas. And then I went to LT, and this is where Tony helped me a lot, and that Understanding Your Physiology program was just out. And so I really could pick and choose what lessons I was going to use in my modules for LT. And so instead of the way this class had previously been taught, where it was system by system, and for each system, every single possible disease that was presented. And while the students really enjoyed it, it was they, all, they just felt it was too much information. And so instead, I wanted to focus more specifically and have them learn a lot about some specific disease, diseases per system. And so instead of flooding them with information, and you can see here, this is one example. So I'm obviously giving them background on the endocrine system and the pancreas and regulation. And then this, this is just an example of another one. And you can pick and choose what lessons you put in there. And this was skeletal muscle and obviously the exercise physiology introduction. And then all of those experiments we have them do in class, those classic ones with tetanus and twitch and all those things are here. And so to familiarize themselves with all that terminology and then compound nerve action potentials, which was really important that they learn because that was gonna be part of the case study. So the names here are the names of the patients in the case studies. And so this is a really fantastic feature. And, and when I was talking with Tony, I said, well, now I'm going to have to go find case studies. He goes, no, 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 we have those too. And I went, wow, that is fantastic. And so the benefit of using these is it's the actual patient talking about their disease or disorder. And they're all, the videos are short. They're usually about two minutes to, to three minutes. And then in addition, they'll have the healthcare providers in there. And it really varies depending on the case study but it could be a doctor, a physician's assistant, a nurse, physical therapist, pretty diverse. And then they sometimes have family members, you know, how is this, how is the family life impacted when this person had this disease or disorder, or how did you have to help them? And then also really cool, it's got their charts. And so it'll have EKGs and blood work and things like that. And so, because a lot of our students are pre-health professions, you know, they really appreciated having that opportunity. And I like to, you know, pointing them in that direction to actually start to look at that information and be able to answer some questions. And so, uh, obviously we know there's so much at our fingertips and as far as, you know, the assignments that we can do in our learning modules. And of course here on the left, you know, we have all those navigation bars and then on the right, he, these are some of my four favorite students that allowed me to use their names here. And you can see the different types of homeworks and the weighting of them. And, you know, we have a lot of opportunity to be able to vary our assignments. But one thing I really shifted to during, during the pandemic was to offer more low stakes assignments compared to high stakes. You know, typically I would have three exams or sometimes four exams, which are weighted very heavily and maybe some quizzes. And so I actually decreased the number of exams and made them more critical analytical thinking and lowered the amount of points they were given for the whole class and then added more low stakes exams. 
or quizzes, excuse me, and low stakes activities. And so really shifting the, the burden more on those and then have them weekly. And so how I designed the course with LT was to create the weekly modules, which I showed you an example, and then the lessons and the case study are in there. And I made the lessons low, st low stakes. And so what that means is they're not graded. I did give them you know, a grade for completing them, but in LT, one of the things you can do is the students can guess the answer or pick the answer. And if it's wrong, they'll, they'll actually, a box pops up and tells them why it's wrong. And then they can guess again or actually choose again. And so that's what I mean by low stakes for those lessons. So in effect, they're learning by their mistakes and then they're getting confirmation when they get it right. And so, and the final part of those lessons was open-ended questions. And that's what I really focused on. And I told them that. I said, I really want some thorough, thorough analysis here and reflection on your learning in here. And that's where you're really getting your grade. And then I made the modules always open 7 a.m. in the morning and ending at midnight. And that was really important for students because, again, asynchronous, their time management, they're fitting in. And typically they do all the work in one sitting. And so one for one particular module, most all of our students work and some work full time. I, I set it for some reason at 7.05 and I got a, a panic email right away that said, can you please open it? This is the one time of the week I do all my work because I work full time. And it was set at 7.05. And so I went and double checked all the rest of them. That was the only one for some reason. And so that was good to know someone was in there in there looking and, and doing it right away. And so this is, here's my, my course. And you can see there's 13 modules and the first and the last does not have a case study. And you can see how focused the content is here for some of them. And then the case study, you know, the related case study. And some of them are very specific, say for the nervous system, myasthenia gravis. And then I also chose ones that they may not be familiar with and to be demonstrating yet one, one more level of understanding for them. And so then in Canvas, they had that weekly quiz on the LT and this was graded. And then I created case study worksheets where uh, I had gave them 10 questions every week and they started off with general information on the case study and then more detailed on the disorders or how they were managing or what their treatment was and maybe some of that lab work, for instance, or the EKGs. And then ended with some reflective, a reflective question on, you know, what other information would you have liked to have seen in the case study? And a lot of times they said they would like a follow up. You know, they want to know how that patient was doing six months after this video was recorded or a year after. And that was a really common thing that they wanted to know. You know, how was the treatment working? How effective the treatment was that they were provided? And then I cut it down to two exams, a midterm and a final. And again, with more critical and analytical thinking type questions and not memorization type. And so I surveyed all the students and I asked them, you know, this open-ended question and they could pick more than one answer. I prefer the LT activities to a textbook because, and you can see here, the majority said it helped them learn the material, which is fantastic. And then the activities are fun, which I'm a big proponent of making learning fun and then more cost-effective, which is what I expected. And then more engaging than the textbook, 41%. So those were wonderful results to see. And then I asked, what did you like most about the activities? And again, they could pick more than one of these. And this was fantastic also. They, I could get the answers wrong with no penalty and then learn from my error. And again, that's those low stakes activities. And that was wonderful that they were learning as they, as they went along. And then they're more interesting than reading the textbook, 55%, fun way to learn. Again, fun is always fantastic. And then they helped me understand the material better and then fit my learning style. And then I provided them with the opportunity to give some open-ended answers. And so here's just a few and I'll read them because they are a little bit heavy on the text. So the LT activities were a great way to learn, especially with the case studies. It is nice that the course focuses on one or two diseases in depth rather than a basic summary of a bunch of them. <laughs> and again, that was how I redesigned it. And then style of learning, I think this is a much better way to learn than just reading and rereading in the text for hours. The interactive nature of learning really favors retention and will be the future of learning, thanks. So how great is that? You know, that the student is really giving us a more thorough answer and prediction for the future. 
And then the use of the LT activities was helpful in mastering the course material because they did not penalize me for an incorrect answer. Instead, I was allowed to fix my answer and thus learn more effectively. And that's wonderful. Again, the, those low stakes assignments. And then this one, I was a little surprised and very happy that the student provided this information. I really enjoyed using LT as a learning method. It provided consistent structure each week and the different interactive modules were fun to learn from. I have ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So sometimes it can be hard to focus, especially when all my classes are online, but the use, use of LT made it fun and easy to focus on the material while learning new things. So that was wonderful. And, and as we really try to be more inclusive in our classes, this is yet one, one additional way. And then with the case studies, I also asked them and provided them with an open-ended response. And the students, this student found the case studies to be very helpful in improving their understanding of the real of the course material because they allowed me to apply the learned concepts to a real life medical situation. Fantastic. And this next one's a little long, but it taught me a lot about pathophysiology I did not previously know. As someone interested in working in the biomedical field, this is important for me, especially if I wanted to do drug development, as I really have to understand the pathophysiology of any disease I'm studying. And then the wonderful application part, some of the things I learned in this class actually helped me in other classes I had this semester too. So that's wonderful. And then this last one, I learned a lot about common diseases as a physiologist, as a lot of physiology I learned in this class will be transferable to dental school. And I heard similar responses that said medical school, physician's assistant school, pharmacy school, all sorts of healthcare professions. They really felt that helped them prepare. And so I would, I want to stress that the future is not all or nothing, right? And that, you know, I would say now that we know these technologies and we've had experience with these technologies, use them to the best advantage of your material and then also for the students. And so I know for my ethics class, you know, when we were all online, I would have the guest speaker come in and it really benefited him to be able to see everyone's names. And I bring in someone from the law school to talk about the legal issues with genetic privacy. And in the typical law school format, he goes back and forth and calls on every single student several times. And so this past fall, we were face to face again and he was on the screen and I had the students make name tags, but you know, it just wasn't the same. And it was hard for him to read the name tags, even though we made him big font. And so next fall, when I teach that class, I'm gonna hold that one session on Zoom because it really benefited that he could call on everyone. And, and so again, having that one session of a face-to-face -face class. And then obviously for a way at a conference, I think most of us have been doing this for quite a long time, you know, record your class and students are fine with that. They're so comfortable now with watching, watching, you know, watching us teach online in that manner is fine. And then for us here in the Northeast of the United States, we get bad weather <laughs> and we know ahead of time because we're always monitoring the weather. Our weather is very variable. And so we never have to cancel class again, which I think is great. And also we're a commuter campus. So I don't want my students driving in bad weather, even if the school is open. And so ahead of time, I'll let them know we're just going to be on Zoom today. And again, students are fine with that. And it keeps everyone safe. And we usually don't lose power across, across our fingers. So that's never an issue as well. And so in over the past many years, I've used a lot of other platforms. And I'm sure some of you have too. And I would always encourage people to use different platforms. And again, it can be just for one assignment or it can be a large component of your classes. And I've done a few studies and published some papers using Twitter to hold course discussions asynchronously on Twitter. And as we know, all journals have Twitter feeds, and that's a nice way for students to be able to find that information easily. And so I would have them focus on the topic at hand and then find an article and post it and start a discussion with the class about the article. And, and I've also brought the librarians in to be able to answer questions on, on doing library research for a research assignment. And just and I've brought guest speakers in to lead a discussion all on Twitter with an asynchronous class. So there's a lot of ways to use these platforms and I encourage you to try them. And don't be afraid because I when I first started this, I had never been on Twitter and most of my students hadn't either. So 
It's not, they don't have to have a lot of experience and you all learn together. And also last, starting last year, I started using Instagram for my class. And this is my wealth class, which again is general education. And I told them I would give them a, a shout out <laughs> for all of you and ask for your help with their current assignment. If you're on Instagram or, or decide to join and what their assignment is to raise awareness about the plastic pollution and how it's affecting marine life and also encourage and demonstrate ways to reduce our plastic use or replace plastic use. And so they post every single week ways to do it. And our this is our hashtag because we are the UNH Wildcats and they came up with this hashtag. And these students work in teams. I do a lot of teamwork with my classes and they get to pick the whale they wanna study for their final project and then pick the name. And so we have the big blue cats, which are studying the blue whales and they they post every week. And then the sea pandas, which are studying orcas and the wild catadons, which are studying sperm whales and baby belugas are obviously studying, uh, the beluga babes are studying belugas and then hump day whales are studying humpbacks. So they this is a graded assignment for them. So help them out by by liking and sharing their, their posts. And this has been a, a fun way to interact with them. And then also other ways, again, uh, to do dramatization in class. And this doesn't take long. And if you have a really large class, you can get some volunteers and do it. My classes tend to be small, anywhere from 12 to 50 students. So I'm able to do a lot of fun stuff in that manner, but don't feel you can't do it if you have a large class. And so here, this is animal physiology and we're studying respiratory physiology. And so these students here holding blue circles are holding oxygen. This is the alveolar membrane the chairs and the other set of chairs are the capillary membrane and these students holding the yellow circles are holding carbon dioxide and so just to emphasize and refresh their memory on diffusion and so now they're diffusing down their concentration gradient here from right to left and now carbon dioxide is diffusing from left to right into the alveolus and then i say in actuality things are going on at the same time and they really enjoy enjoy that and then here they're they are the sodium potassium pump here and you can see three sodium here and two potassium here and here's the pump <laughs> and they had fun. And I found doing these activities, you know, obviously reinforces the material and they ask a lot more questions and obviously have a lot of fun. But of course, how are you going to do this when you're remote, uh, either synchronous or asynchronous? Well, uh, colleagues, uh, colleagues, we'd spent our, our lockdown making these drama Zoom videos and we're in three separate locations. Elena, Elke, and I, and this is four computer screens. And so we made these short videos and you can see the topics underneath. And then we embedded them in our classes. And I, I put them in my asynchronous under chronology class. And then Elke has it in her face-to-face -face anatomy and physiology class for nurses. And then Elena actually shows them in her face-to-face -face medical school class. So it's just a fun way to, and to interact with the students and then reinforce the material. <laughs> And then I wanted to give a shout out to my colleague, Greg Crowther here, and you can look him up on YouTube and he has a lot of physiology songs on there. And yes, we all sang in class and the lyrics were provided. And this was pre-pandemic, we did this study and we had them on the big screen and the students had the lyrics and we all sang the short song that was focused on the topic that we were discussing in class. And then with Greg's help, we broke down, we broke down and had a discussion of what the lyrics actually meant. And that was another way to really help them with the content. And as we know, some of this can be pretty complex. And so that was a really fun way to engage, engage the students and they liked it. So, so don't be afraid to try these new things. And like I said, they can be something short where you're just, you know, inserting it into your regular class. You're taking five, 10 minutes or maybe 15. And, and providing them with content ahead of time so they do have the background knowledge and then do the activity. It's a fun active learning way to engage the students and they usually love it and, and appreciate it. Actually, in my experience, they've always loved it and appreciated it. And so what are the benefits of using all these diverse modalities, increasing the access to a college degree? And that's important, you know, as college costs increase, you know, students are finding more ways to um, decrease that cost and really looking to on, more online learning because they have to work, let's face it. They have to work to cover their costs or for their spending money, for instance. And it provides them with that flexibility 
And as we saw from that student, you know, that really liked the asynchronous online, you know, it's about inclusion as well. And really, you know, adding these courses so they're able to pick, you know, which ones they take that really help fit their learning styles. And we're tending to have more non-traditional students in our campus, you know, meaning that they're older, including military veterans, about 8% of our students are coming back and they're getting their college paid for by the government. And they're starting college when they're in their mid twenties. And then we do once in a while have some working adults with families. And so those are separate challenges. And then also interesting, we just started this post baccalaureate program where, stud where students will come in and just take the prerequisites to go into the health professions, like medical school, for instance, and they have separate, they've already had careers. They already have degrees, they've already had careers and now they wanna change. And so I have, a, I have a couple of these students in my, in my first year biology class. And that's, I love it, that's wonderful because they're providing that life experience and the students are always curious, you know, what their job is right now that they're doing. And, and it really provides some nice diversity for them as well. And of course, they always ask good questions and they're not and they're not shy. So that's always a benefit for everyone. So I would encourage you to try some of these new things, you know, even if it's on a small scale and the benefits are, are really outweigh the risks. And so this is our building. And I love history, as I mentioned. And this is an old woolen mill building. And in Manchester, New Hampshire, the river is lined. The Merrimack River is right over here. And Merrimack is a Native American name. And so we're at the end of the street, but the whole street moving down are filled with all these old mill buildings. And we're really becoming the technology corridor. So a lot of the high tech buildings have taken are behind us. High tech companies have renovated them and including us. And these are actually my two students. <laughs> so I want to thank you for your attention and take it away, Sarah. Thanks so much for that awesome presentation. We're really excited to kick off the Q&A. Are you ready? I am ready. Awesome. Okay. So the first question here is from Roslyn. She's asked, uh, what number of students do you typically have enrolled in your pathophysiology course? And about what percentage are engaging asynchronously? Oh, thank you. Well, I'm lucky to have small classes. So I, I always put the cap at 20 and I always have 20. So it's filled every time and 100% are engaging. So they really come ready to play and they're good. And like I said, this is mostly third year and fourth year students. So this is an elective for their major where they get to choose which ones they want. And they've been choosing it. So that's awesome. Um, and then she has a second part to that question. Um, has engagement improved in all groups with using LT or only in some, some groups of students? Yes, I think it has improved. And actually, my course evaluations have improved, too. So I don't know how other people have. I mean, they're usually pretty good, but they actually went even higher when I started offering this class, which, you know, I, th I know it's been mixed reviews when people went to as asynchronous um, courses. But, you know, it really hit. And again, it hit a need, I think, that we weren't not addressing and hopefully will continue to address with these, these types of offerings. Yeah, definitely. Um, our next question here is from Ruth. Ruth has asked, um, LT, so LT is not associated with a textbook. If you can just like kind of. Correct. So I did not require a textbook due to cost and LT cost about 20% of what they would have been paying for a textbook. So that's really their textbook. Okay. So it was optional for them to buy LT. No, they had to buy it. They had because to buy it, but it was less than their textbook. A lot less. And so that's how they get the content and all those activities that they were doing. And then and the video case studies are all in LT. Yep. Okay, fantastic. That's so great. in the place of a textbook. Right. And it was less expensive. So that helped kind of eliminate some barriers there as well. And then you get 100% that are using it, which is we were not seeing that with the textbook. Right. It was going down. Right. Okay. Um, next question is from Marguerite. Marguerite has asked, um, we use LT for our physiology lab and lab quizzes, and the most feasible option is to make lab quizzes open book. What are your thoughts on making critical thinking exams open book? I think one of the big things that came up, especially during the pandemic, when we started putting more stuff online was cheating. And you can approach it two ways. You know, you can be super policing of them and penalize them, 
or you can design your questions. So really you are addressing the critical thinking component of it, and, which is what I do with the LT exams. I'm sorry, the pathophys exams. So they really can't cheat and they really can't Google it. And so if they, but I would also, if you're going to make it open book, say they still have to study, right? Because I think, and have it timed. And so that's one of the things as well. So it's not open for days on end. And, and so they do have to come prepared because I think they think if it's open book, it's going to be easier and they don't have to study and they can just look up the answer. But that's not always the case if you design your questions that way. Right. Yeah. Design them in a way that you can't just Google it or, you know, find it in a certain chapter in the book, but make it so that they really have to use the book to get the concept and then use the concept and apply it to the question. I think that's going to be really helpful for people. Mm hmm. Awesome. Okay. Next question is from Rob. Rob has asked, do you give students any marks for the intro video? So these are the videos that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, how do you track their reviews of other students' videos um, per your instructions? And if not, what is the incentive for them to contribute a video? Well, to use the word bonus. Mm. <laughs> so I do give them bonus points and I don't tell them how many. And again, at the end, you know, when you have these students that are on the borderline and if you get just a few points are going to, you know, push them up and they've done absolutely everything, then then that would benefit them. Um, and how do I track it? It's in the discussion board in Canvas. So you, I can I go in every day and look to see, you know, who's posted already. And, and then and, and that's an easy way to grade it. And you can grade it right in Canvas, too. So and it's fun to watch them. I like to watch them and I like to comment on them, too. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I definitely would have posted something about my dog. So <laughs> dogs are popular. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for that question, Rob. Um, next question is for Bernard. Bernard has asked, objectively, students who use LT, do they perform better than students who do not? And do they get better grades? With the way that I've redesigned it, they're definitely doing better you know, and they've rarely seen someone fail and the way, and the only reason that a student failed was they just stopped coming because they were having mental health issues with COVID and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, but otherwise, again, making some of those assignments low stakes and they're really doing, you know, 95% of everything you're telling them to do. And so they're really engaging and, and the grades definitely have improved. Mm -hmm. I think no. giving them smaller things to do over the course of a week, they have a week to do it, you know, helps them as well. For sure. I know in a past webinar with Wendy Riggs, who I actually see online with us, um, she mentioned that COVID was a, a real struggle for a lot of students who had experienced um, in-person learning before and that transitioning to online learning um, was a struggle for them because they were so used to sitting in lecture. So I can see how you know, mental health barriers for sure, especially at the beginning of COVID would affect um, a lot of students. So it's awesome that if you give them more assignments um, that are lower stakes, they can still participate and still get good grades um, while also battling other things going on in their lives. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, have you ever used LT sensors um, for your work? No, I haven't. Okay. Okay. Um, someone was asking about the durability of sensors. So that's something that if you attend another session, um, last week's um, first webinar, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about LT sensors and how those are used, um, you can watch the recording of that. Um, just looking through the questions here. Oh, can you um, expand on how long it took you to film those creative videos on Zoom um, with your two other colleagues, just the time investment that it took? Oh, the drama zooms? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> the first one took forever <laughs> because for a really non-content uh, oriented question, it, when we had the four screens, the way each of us were seeing where each of us was, was different. And so in one of those in particular, when we're doing steroid hormone signaling and we have to show that the steroid hormone goes through the membrane, you know, we had, if, if I was going like this, they said, no, 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 you have to go like this. So, that, and also obviously we'd start laughing because it was pretty funny. It's hard <laughs> to just, stay serious. 
and and we do laugh during them and the students really like that they, they're like oh my gosh you guys were so funny <laughs> but um <laughs> which you know that's good too and but so that took several takes and then I've, and so any types of props we were using as we know when you go in and out of the screen that took that took a few trial trial and errors to get us so the first one definitely took a really long time and by the time we got to the last one we had it down so, but we met every week for an hour and, you know, it was just a fun way for us to get together and focus on it. And, and now if we make more, obviously it's going to be really quick. And we did have someone design the graphics for us, which was wonderful because oh, that awesome. wasn't in our area of expertise. But yeah, the, the first one, definitely a long time. But then as we got into it and we made a script, we also made a script. And so, and we would edit that. So we knew what we were doing. We weren't just winging it because again, we were trying to keep them short. Yeah. And it's an upfront load of work for sure. But um, once you put in that work, the, those videos will live on forever. So you can use them over and over again. Yeah, because it's classic information. And again, we used it at, you know, the freshman, sophomore level, the junior, senior level and the med school level. And they were all the same ones. So you're right. It's classic information that either they're getting for the first time or they're getting for the second time or, you know, in medical school, you hope they know it, but maybe they need a refresher. Yeah. And good resources for refreshers for sure. Awesome. We have another question here from Holly. Holly has asked, did your LT lessons also discuss the disease slash disorder that was in the case study or are the LT lessons more background knowledge? It depended. It depended on the lessons. You know, so some of them had had information on diabetes and, and the difference between type one and type two. So that one in particular, um, they did have specific ones, but then uh, some of them didn't. And so they really had to rely on the case study. But the nice thing about the ones that LT did have that information, diabetes is the great example. And then going to that Carol Campbell one where here she was an adult diagnosed with type one. And then again, that's why I picked it because most of the time you think that it's people, younger people being diagnosed from really early age. So mm -hmm. everything was built and reinforced each other, which was nice. Yeah, that's really awesome. And then your quizzes and everything that you designed for um, your labs and whatnot, were those also done in LT? The quizzes were in Canvas. Okay. Okay. And that was for simplification of grading. So all their grades would stay in Canvas. Within so I didn't one. do any grading in LT. Yeah. Okay. But they do have the option, I think, to do Yes. To do quizzes you could do there. quizzes. You could do, well, the lessons that I had in there, those could have been graded. Okay. okay. And, uh, and they have quizzes in there and, the, and you can do your exams in LT too. So. Wow. Didn't know about the exams, but that's really awesome. Um, we have some interaction going on in the chat, but if you do have any more questions for Patricia, please use that Q and a tab to submit them. Um, I also want to say thank you to Wendy because that was reminding me that I, I should put my land acknowledgement in there. And if you haven't seen Wendy's um, video, that I use the same thing with my students where they can click and see where they're located and what tribes live there. And, yes. and students, that creates a nice, inter interesting conversation for first day of class because it's something they probably may not be aware of. Yeah, definitely. And just acknowledging that um, I think is really important too. Mm -hmm. Um, if <laughs> there's Wendy, um, if you haven't caught Wendy's webinar, it is open access. So you can find it on our website at insidescientific.com. If you just search Wendy Riggs, you'll see both of the presentations she's participated in, as well as, um, a podcast episode that she starred in. So to learn a little bit more about Wendy, she's in there. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have. Um, but if you do have a question for P Patricia, please submit it now um, before we close off the event so we can have her answer that. And I want to thank you everyone for coming and your, and your participation. It's always wonderful opportunity. Thanks this for the opportunity. A, this is always a fun crowd for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I really want to thank you, Patricia, for all your time and expertise today. It really was a pleasure to have you with us and I hope that you had fun. I did. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. In closing, we hope that you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar sponsored by 80 Instruments, and we'll see you again next week for the third webinar in the series. Thanks so much.